subject. Um, so thanks everybody for taking your time out of your evening to join us um, by Road America. We have what is probably one of the most exciting subjects to me personally. Um, we're talking about SIBO tonight and our IBS shore testing, and we have Dr. Diane Mueller with us um, this evening to walk us through how that's uh, how that's going to go. So my name is Sarah Ashman. I'm a member of the clinical team at um, Vibrant America as well as a marketing liaison, and I am super stoked to have Dr. Diane Mueller here. She is a registered naturopathic doctor um, as well as a doctor of acupuncture and oriental medicine. Um, she's been featured on Fox News as well as several radio stations, and her career has shined as a naturopathic doctor on staff in an integrative care setting at Swedish Hospital in Denver, as well as with her private practice in the Denver area. Her dedication to education has propelled her involvement in teaching in master's level nutrition and acupuncture programs. She's also been featured as a speaker and panelist in breast cancer awareness events. And Dr. Diane has been a featured speaker at an annual conference for the National Association of Nutrition Professionals, as well as keynote speaker at Nutrition Therapy Association Natural, National Conference. In addition, Dr. Mueller has over a decade of comprehensive training in functional medicine. She's the co-founder and co-teacher of a functional medicine certification program, where she trains clinicians to understand functional lab test interpretation and treatment. And she'll give you a little bit more information about that later on this evening. Um, she's going to let you know in today's webinar how to take additional steps to continue training with her. Um, more to come after that. So uh, with... Uh, no further delay, Dr. Mueller, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you and let you go ahead and um, educate us all this evening. So thanks a lot for being here. Thank you, Sarah, and hello, everybody. I'm really looking forward to tonight's webinar and sharing the information that I've been gathering over the past couple of years about SIBO. All right, so beginning with what is SIBO? And SIBO is a really important thing to start with defining because we want to make sure we're all on the same page here. So SIBO is defined as 10 to the fifth up to 10 to the sixth organisms of bacteria in the small intestine. So the small intestine is relatively sterile as compared to the large intestine. However, the small intestine is not completely sterile. It is normal to have some microorganisms in the small intestine. But once we reach these levels, 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth, that's when we begin to see some of the disease processes and some of the symptoms that are associated with SIBO. So you guys, the next thing that I think is so, so important that it's made really clear is the overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine with SIBO are normal bacteria for the gastrointestinal tract. So it's not so much that we have an abnormal bacteria here, but that we have bacteria that's been mis like dislocated and is now in the wrong place. And I'm gonna tell you as we go through this webinar, I'm gonna show you how that is true. But this becomes so important when we're thinking about testing for small intestinal bacteria overgrowth because these are normal flora. So if we run, say, a, a, say a gut zoomer, we, and we find a pathogenic bacteria, or we don't find a pathogenic bacteria. That's actually not going to tell us any information about small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So we want to make sure that we're really looking and isolating these tests, the gut zoomer and the IBS shore, we're isolating them and we're using them both and using them for their perspective parts of the body that we're investigating. So the IBS shore for the small intestine, the gut zoomer for the large intestine. And so then why is this important? Why are we talking about this? So here's just a few uh, statistics. So 84% of those with irritable bowel syndrome have SIBO according to one research study. SIBO, and I'm gonna show you some research to support all these. SIBO is a cause of leaky gut. And leaky gut is one of a triad of factors that leads to autoimmune disease. So now we can see that SIBO can lead to gut, can lead to autoimmunity. And once we realize that, the number of people that we need to consider that they could be, have a positive SIBO test and they could have a positive SIBO diagnosis are, it's, it's just really large. And then linked to other health conditions such as chronic fatigue, chronic regional pain sim syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, H. pylori, osteoporosis, renal failure, malabsorption of nutrients, and there's a couple other dozen health conditions out there. These are just some of the main ones. 
So we really want to remember that when we're looking at the functioning of the body, everything is related, everything is connected. So we want to consider this test, we want to consider SIBO, not just when we have GI problems, but when we have other problems too. So here we have a study that is looking at lipopolysaccharides. Now lipopolysaccharides are part of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. So any normal flora that is gram-negative that ends up from the large intestine migrating to the small intestine and making a home there is going to release lipopolysaccharides. And lipopolysaccharides, a study is showing that even at physiologic concentrations, it can cause an increase in tight junction permeability, which is otherwise known as leaky gut. So what we're really saying here is SIBO is going to secrete, is going to release this lipopolysaccharide, and then that's going to cause leaky gut. And then here, this next slide is this autoimmune uh, uh, research study that I mentioned earlier, where what we're basically saying here that's so interesting is that autoimmune processes, autoimmune disease processes, are always a triad of a few different things. So there's a genetic predisposition. So we have to have the gene in order to develop the disease. But as most of us know, just because we have a gene does not mean we have the disease. So there's an environmental trigger that comes on and that creates that epigenetic change and all of a sudden that gene gets expressed. So, so far we have two things. We have genes and we have the trigger that's gonna cause the gene to express. And the third thing is intestinal permeability. So that triad is what we see leads to the development of autoimmunity. And, and it's so, intestinal permeability is so big here with autoimmunity that what this study was found is that as soon as that intestinal barrier function was restored, as soon as that leaky gut was eliminated, without even addressing the environmental trigger, although we should address that too for good health, but without even addressing that, all of a sudden autoimmune disease uh, goes into remission. All of a sudden markers go down to normal and disease processes disappear. So you can see, you know, looking at this, why SIBO as a root cause of leaky gut is so important. So here this study basically showed that this was a lactulose breath test um, that was done to analyze SIBO. And we're going to talk about some of the, the differences and some of these testing mechanisms later so you have an understanding of this. So this lactulose breath test in this particular study was found 84% positive in IBS patients. So 84% of people with IBS basically were positive for SIBO. So, you know, for so long we thought that IBS is this disease process of, or this not even disease process and syndrome, this conglomeration of symptoms, and we don't even know why. And so now with, um, with this understanding of SIBO, we actually can see that SIBO is a root cause of irritable bowel syndrome, certainly not the only cause, but a big player. So then how do we get SIBO? So then let's take a step back. And in order to really start talking about the pathogenesis here, we need to look at the migrating motor complex. So the migrating motor complex, we're gonna start looking at it by saying up here, we're gonna say that we have acute gastroenteritis. So we have some sort of acute infection. We have uh, gastroenteritis type of symptoms, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, a variety of things, but self-limiting. So it's, it's acute, it goes away, and we think people are fine. But here's where it gets a little bit more interesting is right here we see that, uh, that acute gastroenteritis, most of these bacteria that are gonna cause gastroenteritis such as Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, when they are in our body, they're gonna uh, cause a release of cytolethal descending toxin. And that cytolethal descending toxin is basically going to cause a reaction against something that is known as vinculin. See, vinculin is a protein, and vinculin is a protein which helps to regulate something called the interstitial cells of, of Kajal. The interstitial cells of Kajal helps to regulate something called the migrating motor complex. So this is a lot. So I'm going to say this a couple times because I want you guys to really understand this. So the 
the acute gastroenteritis, these bacteria are going to cause a release of this uh, cytolethal toxin. And that cytolethal toxin is going to react through a molecular mimicry type of reaction. So we're going to create an antibody against that toxin. And through molecular mimicry, the toxin looks similar enough to vinculin, our body's protein, that all of a sudden our body starts cross-reacting with vinculin. And now we have a antibody against vinculin. Now that antibody against vinculin is gonna damage the interstitial cells of Kajal. The interstitial cells of Kajal regulate the migrating motor complex. So the migrating motor complex, its job is to clear the intestinal tract when we are in a fasting state. So if I have bacteria, the normal flora in my large intestine, if they crawl up to my small intestine, which they do, in health, what happens is the migrating motor complex every 90 to 120 minutes in a fasting state will contract and wash those bacteria out. And so as those bacteria are washed out, they're not making a home in the small intestine. And when they're not making a home, they're not fermenting and causing SIBO. But what we're saying here in this slide is that CD that CD uh, TB toxin is going to lead to that antibinculin antibody being secreted damage to the interstitial cells of conjol, damage to the migrating motor complex, and all of a sudden we can't flush that bacteria out. So here's another slide looking at this from a slightly different way. So we see here that we have um, these two antibodies that are gonna lead to the damage of the interstitial cells of conjol. Then we're gonna get dysmotility. Then once we have dysmotility, all of those bacteria, the normal flora that are in the large intestine, crawl to the small intestine, they make a home, and they ferment. And we're used to fermenting in our large intestine, but when we start fermenting in our small intestine, that's where we get a lot of gas, that's where we get a lot of bloating, that's when we can get some uh, constipation or diarrhea. So we really have a couple different things here. We have the food poisoning, which causes the dysmotility. So that's step one. And then we have the CDTB cross antibody cross reaction with vinculin. The vinculin antibodies develop. And since vinculin is part of the interstitial cells of Cadrol and that migrating motor complex, I call it the washing machine. The washing machine of the stomach or the intestinal tract basically stops. So other things that have been shown in research to cause, to be root causes of SIBO are abdominal surgery and low stomach acid. We know H. pylori is a big cause of low stomach acid. Um, so with that, we have to consider the H. pylori in here as well as a cause of SIBO. And it's also important to realize that about 70% of SIBO, it's estimated is caused by this food poisoning type of reaction. And it's also important to realize that some people, they have food poisoning and they don't even know they have it. You know, we can go out to eat at a restaurant and we can come home and maybe we don't have obvious food poisoning symptoms where we are, um, you know, vomiting and having diarrhea and having these really acute reactions, but we could have some non-obvious things happen, such as we could feel a little nauseous, maybe get a headache, maybe we need to go to bed early and, you know, we write it off as something just did not settle right. And, you know, perhaps our body was able to clear the microorganism quickly, but that doesn't mean there wasn't necessarily a microorganism there. So when we look at it from that standpoint, the number of people that have SIBO, um, that could have SIBO, potentially really pretty large. So here's, here's a study looking at motility, basically showing that the, during periods of fasting, the migrating motor complex basically runs every 90 to 120 minutes to sweep debris through the GI tract. And we're seeing so there are several studies out there that basically are showing that abnormalities in the migrating motor complex predispose to the development of SIBO. And then here's another study looking at anti-CDTB antibodies and basically showing that the anti-CDTB antibodies will bind to the interstitial cells of Kajal. And then once the CDTB antibody binds, that's when we can start, like this study is saying, that's when we can start cross-reacting with vinculin. So these are just some studies that are kind of showing you from a research perspective a little bit more about what I was talking about. So this study is showing that the development, the development of long-term consequences following an acute episode of gastroenteritis 
reflects factors that include genetic predisposition as well as development of intestinal dysbiosis. So what we're really saying here is that an acute episode of gastroenteritis has long-term consequences. So this is something that I'm constantly educating my patient population about is that if you have, if you ever get food poisoning, if you ever think you get food poisoning, let me know right away because we want to test and we want to check for these things to make sure that, that this uh, process is not developing. So diminished acid production, hypochlorhydria is a risk factor of SIBO and can develop after colonization with H. pylori. So here's a little bit about the H. pylori and the hypochlorhydria being a component of the development of SIBO. So here's a, another, another study looking at GI tract surgeries, especially ones that create blind loops, can predispose to bacterial stasis and overgrowth due to abnormal motility. So if you have anything that's gonna affect motility, there's potential of this happening. So when are we gonna test? So these are the main reasons why I would consider testing. There's others, of course, like anything in medicine, it's never completely simple. But these are the big ones. So any common symptoms of SIBO slash IBS, gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. Um, autoimmunity food poisoning, any history of, of abdominal surgery, if anybody has any of these things, for sure test for SIBO. Ehlers-Danlos is really interesting. It's interesting the, the connections we've seen. There's not tons of studies on this, but there are a couple that are showing um, links between uh, SIBO and Ehlers-Danlos. And then osteoporosis, which is likely in my you know, perception, probably due to a leaky gut and a malabsorption type of scenario that occurs when we have intestinal inflammation. Okay, so here's getting down to some really interesting nitty gritty. So the number one clinically way that we have seen that is surefire the best way to test for SIBO is a duodenal aspirate. But who the heck wants to send every patient that needs a SIBO test in for that? It's invasive, it's expensive, um, that's not, it's just not clinically very doable. So although that's you know, a really great test, it's, it's really not a, a accessible for the amount of people that we need to test for for SIBO. And then the two that are most talked about on the market, one is the glucose breath test. The second is the lactulose breath test. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the pros and cons about those. So the glucose breath test is estimated to be about 62% sensitive and 81% specific. So not, so although it's pretty specific, not all that sensitive. The lactulose breath test is estimated to be about 52% sensitive in multiple research studies and 85% specific. So better specificity, less sensitivity. Now, there are some problems, though. A lot of the re reason why a lot of practitioners are using lactulose over glucose in the field is because the whole idea of using a test like that, how it works, is that we are giving the body a sugar, and sugar, if, if there's SIBO there, then the SIBO will ferment, and then we collect the breath. We collect the, the, the gases. And so with that... As we, as we collect the gases, then we measure that and we see how much gases are. And, and if there's a lot, then we know it's SIBO. Now, glucose is absorbed in the first three feet of the small intestine, pretty much 100% absorbed. And it's estimated we have about 20 feet of small intestine. So the problem is with the glucose is, you know, even though it's reasonably specific, it's not very sensitive. Um, and as somebody I just saw mention that if it's sensitive, we're going to get a lot of false negatives. So it's absolutely true. So even if, even though, you know, we can get some positives on it, we are going to miss a lot because that glucose is really easily absorbed in the first part of the small intestine. It's not going to make its way to the latter part of the small intestine and anything that's in the latter part of the small intestine, we're going to miss. Now, lactulose is not a absorbable sugar. We don't really have the enzyme to break down lactulose in our gastrointestinal tract. So lactulose will, provided we don't have leaky gut, it will make its way all the way through the intestinal tract so we can catch some of those. If SIBO is present in the later part of the small intestine, we can catch it there. Now, I believe one of the reasons why the glucose and lactulose breast tests don't 
pick up a lot is because they actually, there's actually a third type of gas, and this is where the hidden SIBO comes in. So the glucose and lactulose breath tests both look for hydrogen gas and they look for methane gas. But we know from things like duodenal aspirates, we know that, there's, that there are gases that are produced that are not tested. And, and the one that we know of is um, hydrogen sulfide. So there's not a test on the market that is analyzing hydrogen sulfide. There, is, there are ways to extrapolate the, some of the data from the lactulose breath test to give us some ideas if there is, um, if there is hydrogen sulfide type of SIBO there, but it's not for sure. So um, that's, you know, that's just a tricky part about diagnosing. Now, the gut tumor, I want to make really clear here. I mentioned this earlier, um, 20 minutes ago, saying that we don't want to utilize the gut tumor to analyze SIBO. Like, I talked to somebody um, recently who was sharing with me that he was just running the gut tumor because he you know, what was the point of doing something like a different test? It makes more sense according to what he was thinking to test the gut tumor because if there's a positive, then you know what microorganism you're treating. And while that's true for the large intestine, because we're not really dealing with pathogenic bacteria that's causing SIBO, or that's, that's really causing the acute SIBO or the chronic SIBO, I should say, we have pathogenic bacteria that cause that migrating motor complex to get dysregulated, sure. But then usually that clears. And then what we're talking about is normal flora that's actually deeply rooted in the, the ongoing SIBO reactions, the ongoing SIBO symptoms. So we don't really want to use the gut zoomer for determining if there's a problem because we're going to miss if there's actually a problem in the small intestine. If we have H. pylori come up on the gut zoomer, we could say, oh, this person may have low stomach acid and that means that they could maybe have a you know, tendency to, towards getting SIBO, but we don't really know. Um, so that's, you know, that's a little bit questionable way of doing it. So I would definitely run the gut tumor, look for those microorganisms. Abso absolutely. We just need to make sure that we're using it clinically for what it's designed for, which is really looking at more of the large intestine um, and the microbiome and all those great markers in there, but not, not so much for analyzing the small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Now, some clinicians out there are diagnosing based upon symptoms. And honestly, I don't even think that's the worst way of going. It's we're going to miss things. I've had autoimmune people that have absolutely no um, GI symptoms at all that I have used things like the lactulose breath test and found SIBO. And, you know, so we want to be careful about just saying if it's if it's their symptoms there, then we're always going to only treat based upon that. If there are symptoms on there, then yeah, it's a reasonable thing to, to treat there. But even if we do, even if we decide, okay, we're going to do a diagnosis based upon symptoms, then I would always recommend using this IBS Shore because even if we're going to do it based upon symptoms, what this IBS Shore is giving us that some of these other tests don't give us is the ability to regulate it, how we're doing as far as preventing recurrence. The recurrence rates of SIBO are so, so, so high. So we can use it for a couple different reasons. We can use it, one, to actually tell us if there's this chain of events with food poisoning that's causing problem, which is going to catch probably about 70% based upon 70% of the people with SIBO do have this whole progression that starts from food poisoning. So that's going to be better already than what we're looking at from the glucose and lactulose. So that's one. So one, we can look at that to see, okay, do we have this progress of things where we are having a reaction with these antibodies, letting us know there's been food poisoning. The second piece is we want to make sure that we are doing everything we can to basically prevent the recurrence since it's so high. And we want to make sure that we're doing that by running the IBS shore at the beginning when we're looking, when we're starting treatment. And then as we're working, and we're going to show you guys some treatment ideas here in a little while, and as we're working to really repair the migrating motor complex, and we're working to repair that whole process, we want to make sure at the end of that, that protocol that we put people on, that we are going in and we are retesting with the IBS shore to see that, yes, we did indeed change that. And what I would recommend is that doing the IBS short at the very beginning when we're suspecting SIBO, 
doing it once we've cleared SIBO and then and symptoms are better and we're managing progress about the three month mark as we're working on the migrating motor complex come in and do it again and make sure those um, especially that antivinculin antibody make sure that level is coming down because that's telling us that we are on the right path that what we're doing the treatments we're doing are working and then again um, say about six months. Most of the time I find that it takes about six months to really reset the migrating motor complex. So that's what I would recommend is around that six month mark doing the IVF sugar again so you can really determine that this person is clear of any sort of um, vinculant antibodies so that we can um, be safe to basically send them out into the world and we don't know, we know that their likelihood of getting recurrence is pretty low unless they get food poisoning again. So I'm not even saying, you know, just to be clear, like with all of this, like we can use a combination of a variety of things. We just want to make sure we know the positives and negatives of everything. And I think that's where this test has just so um, much advantage over some of these other things on the market is because we are catching more things because of the great sensitivity and the uh, amazing use of the microchip with uh, analyzing these antibodies. And then we're able to evaluate the uh, the process of the migrating motor complex. So this is just to kind of drill this home for you guys. So we have a toxin release it from the food poisoning. It's that cytolethal descending toxin B, molecular mimicry. Now where our body, our immune system's confused, we're going to start attacking um, vinculin and make antibodies to vinculin. Then vinculin disrupts those interstitial cells of Kajal. So other things that um, the IBS sure is going to do, so we're saying if it's positive, it's helping us identify an infectious cause of SIBO, it's helping us evaluate the MMC function. Other things to know about is that the antivinculin antibodies, will this help us distinguish if we're trying to determine if somebody has IBS or IBD? So elevations of antivinculin have been, have been shown to be correlated with IBS, not IBD. A little bit more common with IBSD than IBSC. So we see that a little bit more leaning to the IBSD, although um, I have seen both. But definitely a great marker if we're trying to determine if there is, you know, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis going on. This can help us um, distinguish between those, and you know, hopefully help avoid things like colonoscopies. So this is just a case example of what we're looking at. So we see here in this um, example, we see this antivinculin antibody. Here is 11, previously 25. So we see, and this is what we're looking for to happen at that three month mark after we've been treating, and definitely by that six month mark that we should really see these things returning back to normal. We see the cytolethal descending toxin B at a 30 go down to now a six. So in a situation like this, you know, we're really, really close to the end, and something that sometimes um, practitioners that I, I train will ask me is, do we need to continue treatment at this point? Do I need to ask the patient to pay money to retest? And what I tell them is abso abso absolutely. Because this recurrent rate is so, so, so high, this is a really exciting test. Like, look at these changes. These are amazing, amazing changes. However, we don't want to leave somebody in this state. And we'd way rather say, let's continue treatment, let's invest in that retest, than start all over at the beginning because we didn't do our diligence and make sure these things were cleared. And then all of a sudden, when these things aren't cleared, then we have um, the ability for SIBO to just you know, return back, which is really, quite frankly, like one of the main things some of these other tests are missing because they are not able to go through and say, how are we doing? Like, are we really creating a change in people that is so deep that we can have them successfully move out into the world and knowing that it's not going to come back? So treatment questions come up a lot. So I want to go through some of the pharmaceutical things and then as well as some of the herbal things. So pharmaceutical, we treat a little bit different if there's constipation or no constipation. So without constipation, meaning no constipation or diarrhea, um, we do rifaximin or zyfaxin is, is the generic at 550 milligrams TID times 14 days. Now, if you try that, that protocol, the rifaximin at 550 milligrams here, you try that and somebody has constipation, it's 
probably not going to work. And I don't use a lot of pharmaceutical. I tend to use more herbal. I'm going to show you a study that shows that herbal actually performs better than pharmaceutical. So it's been pretty rare that I've used pharmaceutical, but I have seen people come to my office that have been treated by other docs for SIBO. And it's very um, clear that they have constipation and they were just given rifaximum and they don't feel better at all because with constipation, um, the constipation is letting us know that there's a different type of microorganisms. They tend to be more methane producers uh, as a whole, and we really need a second, um, a second prescription in order to really clear the SIBO. So do the, if they have constipation, definitely get them on the rifaximum, and then also add neomycin at 500 milligrams BID for 14 days, or metronidazole at 250 milligrams TID for 14 days. And then um, herbally speaking, so this is the study I'm talking about. So this study is basically showing that 46% of those who received herbal therapy, um, this was using the lactulose breath test, so 46% had a negative follow-up versus 34% of the rifaximum users had a negative follow-up. So, you know, basically in this study, herbal therapy performs 12% better. And... Um, the herbal therapies that were used, there was dysbiocide and FC cytal by biotics, and then a couple um, of metagenics products as well, candy bactin. So you can look at that study um, when you get the slides and um, read more about the, the specific um, nutrients in there. But a lot of the things in these products are things that we're listing here. So berberine containing herbs, oil of oregano, neem, Methane producers, allicin, the active constituent in garlic, definitely recommended. Um, it works so much better that way. So um, how I would recommend doing that is methane is almost always going to be constipation. So if somebody has constipation, throw in some allicin. And then loracidin, monolaurin um, is also helpful. Lactobacillus plantarum, there's a product called Ideal Bowel Support that has a decent amount of this particular microorganism that we use and then a trantal. So I wanna show you guys in a little bit of research here. So this is looking at the research around the antibacterial um, components of berberine. The study was done on um, MRSA. And in addition to the antimicrobial, berberines also have biofilm, or berberines also help with biofilm breakdown. And it's a little bit debated in the field if the microorganisms that are involved with SIBO uh, actually produce biofilms. It doesn't feel to be clear in research yet, but there's definitely potential there. And we're learning more and more about SIBO every day. So having something that has a side benefit of breaking down biofilms is definitely going to be a um, benefit just in case um, what we're seeing in the research that's saying, yeah, there's potential that, that this is true actually is true. And then oil of oregano. So oil of oregano um, will work for some bacteria, not for others. Oil of oregano does, I've seen really good clinical results with it. We want to make sure if we're using oil of oregano, we're getting enteric coated because otherwise the oil of oregano seems to really start be, uh, breaking down in the intestine or the, the stomach. And it's not going to make its way to the int small intestine. So we're not going to get that same sort of value. So make sure you get an uh, enteric oil of oregano. Neem, I haven't seen as many people using neem, but um, I've used it a little bit. Other people in the field are using it with some success. So it's definitely antimicrobial. I would definitely not recommend using neem as a standalone. Um, it seems to be certainly best in combination with other, other micro or other antimicrobials. So here, this is looking at um, Lactobacillus plantarum. And the reason, one of the reasons, the study is looking at a, a couple other microorganisms too. One of the reasons why we focus on Lactobacillus plantarum is because in addition to helping with the reduction of SIBO and, and treating of SIBO, it doesn't seem to exacerbate SIBO. And we have to be really careful because there was a lot of, a lot of times if we're giving probiotics, it can exacerbate SIBO. And it makes so much sense, right? Because if we are adding additional microorganisms to the small intestine, so we're taking those probiotics and they go into the small intestine, and we already have too many microorganisms there, then there could be a problem with actually causing more fermentation. But Lactobacillus plantarum seems to work really well, and it is anti-SIBO. In addition to that, 
um, spore-based probiotics work really well because spore-based probiotics, because they're encapsulated in their spore, they actually make their way all the way to the large intestine um, before breaking down. So we can actually repopulate the large intestine that way. I haven't seen research. There might be some. I haven't found any, though, that is saying that spore-based actually is going to dramatically um, treat SIBO. Uh, but it definitely can help with uh, the large intestine. So if we are doing something, say we run an IBS short, and say we run a gut tumor, and yes, we are looking at a SIBO picture, and we're also looking at a um, parasite. So we have Giardia in the large intestine. Definitely going to want to get some probiotics there, but we want to be very careful when we're giving the probiotics that, in that case, that we would give a spore base to help with the large intestine infection and not exacerbate the SIBO. And always go slow with, um, I would say, any spore base just in case because um, people can really, if they do react, although they don't tend to with the spores, but if they do, it's really uncomfortable. So this is looking, a study looking at lactobacillus plantarum and how it's actually um, reducing methane output. So the thought here is that it's actually killing SIBO. And once the, the um, methane SIBO is being killed and there's less methane output. So lactobacillus um, plantarum is definitely a good thing to use, especially with that constipation type of SIBO. So monolaurin. So monolaurin is another thing that a lot of people are using in the field for SIBO. And um, we have used this a bunch in our clinic. So there's not any studies looking at SIBO directly, but it is definitely a antimicrobial against anaerobic bacteria. It's antimicrobial against streptococcus and enterococcus. It it's a methane inhibitor, so definitely good for, again, constipation. And it's also an antifungal. And it's something that I want to throw out um, using using it for small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Now, small intestinal fungal overgrowth is just getting to be more researched right now. So we're finally getting um, some of the conventional research to actually look and say that candida, for example, is not just a opportunistic infection that seizes an opportunity when the immune system is severely compromised or when we are in surgery or these types of scenarios that that the opportunistic uh, nature of fungus can be a much more mild opportunity. It can be a dysregulation of the normal flora. It can be the Im immune system being dysregulated. And I wanted to mention this because sometimes what we can see is we can treat SIBO and we can follow up with IBS short and we can say, oh my gosh, it looks like everything is good. And every once in a while, it will, sh it will see that people still have um, some similar GI symptoms. And, and we're seeing research that's showing that basically many people also have CFO. So I wanted to throw this in there. So if you guys run this, you treat, you follow up, you retest, and you're like, well, what the heck is going on? Because I did all these steps. That's kind of the, one of the next things to think about is throwing in some of those antifungals. And, and so monolaurin is nice because we're going to get a little bit about that. So um, it's bacterial cytal to staph aureus and to a couple other organisms, not so much E. coli here. And then we're seeing some other um, bacteria that basically monolaurin helps with, so streptococcus, enterococcus. And here we're looking at biofilms. So monolaurin has the ability to bust down biofilms, um, very antifungal against candida. So there's some of that SIBO. Um, so I want to also educate you guys here because there's a little confusion in the field about the difference between monolaurin and lauric acid. So let's skip ahead one slide here. So monolaurin basically is a monoglyceride formed inside the body. Lauric acid is structurally similar. Lauric acid we get from things like coconut oil, and then our body is going to create monolaurin. Now, the reason that's important is because we see research that shows when we actually are using monolaurin and lauric acid together, they're going to create a stronger antimicrobial. So there's products out there such as lauricidin is the one we use, which is a monolaurin product on the market. But because of this research saying that, hey, they work synergistically together, even though they are very structurally similar, they work better when they're taken together. Anytime that we are going to supplement somebody with some monolaurin, we'll always have them take it with coconut oil to increase the strength. 
So some of how monolaurin works is it's changing the cytoplasm of the bacterial cells so our immune system can attack them better, um, increases T cell uh, proliferation, blocks the expression of inflammatory chemokines and cytokines. So now this whole inflammatory chain of communication is shut down. We get the inhib inhibition of recruitment of CD4 T cells and a decrease in TNF alpha. So really working on a great, you know, monolaurin is so good because we're getting some anti sibo some biofilm disruption, some anti sifo and we're helping to regulate the immune system and deal with some of the inflammation that is created from, um, from things like SIBO. So with Trantil, a Trantil is another product on the market you will um, hear about. So a Trantil has been shown to really help with bloating and constipation. And one of the reasons how it how, the reasons why it does that is because it's going to stop methane production. So um, this is uh, this is straight from atrantil.com and their facts. Um, seen definitely seen some good um, you know good clinical data, and there's certainly studies like this that are really backing up saying there's there is a great improvement in um, constipation and bloating. I would never use a trantil on its own to treat SIBO, would always be combining it with berberines, um, with oil of oregano, uh, to do that. We, we did a very, very small, um, pilot study in our clinic on SIBO. We found like we were looking at the combination of a few different products and we actually found that, um, berberines themselves with, uh, with using a few other products like the atrantil, but without adding tons of extra antimicrobials like oil of oregano did seem to give us the most consistent results. But really what I would recommend is having, you know, having several of these things in the arsenal because certainly people do respond to things differently. That's definitely very, very clear. So it's, you know, it's good to have a, a few things that you are, able to access. And then we also see that um, here we're looking at um, Allison. So I mentioned earlier that Allison was really important with the constipation type of SIBO. And that's because it's actually going to decrease the population of the methogen producing archaea. There's a different microorganism that tends to be involved with the production of, meth of methane known as an archaea, and that allicin will actually target that particular microorganism. So anytime we have constipation, we always want to throw in that allicin. So to kind of sum this up before we move on to the next section, I would say for, you know, if you come back and you say, okay, IBF short is positive we need to we need to start with treating for SIBO then we're asking do them do they have diarrhea or constipation and you know utilizing if we decide to go to the pharmaceutical route making sure we're throwing in a um, neomycin or metronidazole on top of that rifaximum if it is constipation and then if it's um you know no constipation or diarrhea or diarrhea then we would more use the the rifaximum only and with that um, we can also use for diarrhea any of those antimicrobials that I talked about. Berberines and oil oregano really do seem to be the strongest. And then making sure we're throwing in allicin as well for the, um, for the constipation. And then we can also consider things like atrantil and the lactobacillus plantarum. We keep those around just to be, have a variety of things um, since everybody does respond differently. And so now what do we do about the MMC? So now we, you know, we've gotten people to a point their, you know, symptoms are almost negative. They're feeling really good. And now we want to make sure that we are um, preventing recurrence. So it's really important to know that the MMC is not the same as peristalsis. So both are stimulated through unique hormones and unique nervous system activity. And so what we're looking at here, so on the left of these two pictures, we see the migrating motor complex. And you see from here to here, there is vagal activity for the migrating motor complex. For postprandial contract, post contraction, so for peristalsis segmentation, we are looking at the, the vagal nerve is interacting pretty much the entire time. Now, the problem with this, with the vagal nerve and the MMC, is look at over here, the vagal nerve is not influencing phase three of the migrating motor complex at all. So what does that mean? 
So phase one, so let's look at the phases. So phase one is kind of a quiet phase. There's not much happening there. Phase two is low amplitude contractions, a little infrequent. Phase three is when we get those high amplitude contractions that are really working to clean out the debris. So it's really phase three that has the activity that's cleaning out the debris. So despite looking at this and saying, well, yeah, the vagal nerve does influence MMC a little bit, but despite looking at this, because it doesn't influence the phase three, it's not actually going to be directly involved in clearing that debris out. So while we know that healthy vagal nerve function is so, so, so important by dig for digestion, and we should absolutely be focusing on that for overall digestive health, we can't just do a lot of the things that we normally know for vagal nerve health and think we're going to get the MMC to work again. So peristalsis versus MMC. So peristalsis is going to begin in the esophagus when we swallow. Just a little quick review. We know it moves through the stomach and, the, and small intestine. It helps move through the digestive tract. Once in the digestive tract, we have that churning, that this is that segmentation. So, you know, you can see in these pictures just as a um, – anatomy and physiology review for you all that we get this the bolus of food that is basically moving all the way down all the way down eventually to the anus so that's what peristalsis is right it's really about regulating the food and peristalsis is really active when we are not fasting it's stimulated by eating so we have vagal nerve stimulation in the esophagus in the stomach we have stretch receptors that are basically gonna stimulate that contraction. Small intestine, we also have stretch receptors and we have the enteric nervous system controlling it. The interstitial cells of Kajal, so there are interstitial cells of Kajal that regulate peristalsis. There's different interstitial cells of Kajal that regulate the migrating motor complex. The interstitial cells of Kajal for peristalsis are also regulating the, uh, the digestive tract as a pacemaker. They are located throughout the entire digestive tract. So they're from the esophagus to the anus. And we see that there's stretch receptors that basically are creating some of the signal that is allowing for the peristalsis contraction. So acetylcholine and substance P are gonna be used, vagal nerve's gonna be involved, and we're gonna see a few different inhibitory agents that are gonna play their role. Now for peristalsis itself, remember peristalsis and the MMC function, we're gonna treat them in different ways. So if somebody eats a meal and says, oh my gosh, I eat this meal and I feel like I'm full, this could certainly be low stomach acid. Could also, that could also be a keynote to say, okay, well, you're not moving food through very well, that's peristalsis problem. Now if they get really bloated, 30 or 40 or 50, 60 minutes after eating, then we're starting to question, did that food start moving into the small intestine and is now feeding those bacteria that are there and causing fermentation? And that would be more of SIBO. So for peristalsis, we can use choline, since acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter. There's studies on electroacupuncture increasing for peristalsis activity. Um, anything that increases vagal nerve activity, so yawning, meditation. Um, there's even a study on playing the didgeridoo on vagal nerve activity, which is great. And all those things are so lovely, but they're not going to do this. They're not going to work on the migrating motor complex. So the migrating motor complex, remember, this is different. So now we're talking about fasting. And the purpose is really just to clean the debris. The migrating motor complex 99% of the studies I see say stomach and small intestine. There is one study I found that says that there might be some activity in the large intestine, but that's definitely a debatable thing. It definitely does not seem, from a treatment perspective, when we upregulate the migrating motor complex, we don't see people, I don't see people have diarrhea, for example. So if somebody had, already has diarrhea, the migrating motor complex does not, um, increasing this does not make that symptom worse. I've ne literally never seen that. So that definitely you know, tells me that if there is migrating motor complex in the large intestine, it's not operating in quite the same way as the stomach and the small intestine. So vagal nerve and um, ghrelin. So vagal nerve, like I said, will, will um, influence um, phase one and phase two. It will influence the stomach more than the small intestine. Fasting, so fasting will release ghrelin. Ghrelin is one of the best ways we can get the migrating motor complex to work. So making sure that people are not eating between meals 
if we're dealing with a child, obviously that's hard. And I guess I should throw in here too that that's another, I feel like, great clinical utility of the IBS Sure because it's going to be a lot easier to get a child to draw blood as much as that is still challenging than to breathe correctly in those breath tests. That's really pretty impossible for children to do. So it's another great clinical point of, of um, this particular test. So making sure that we're fasting to get the MMC going. So not eating between meals. Usually I recommend for people that um, when we're treating the MMC that they do a 16 hour intermittent fast two to three times a week and just trying to extend that fasting period as long as possible so that we can really get this MMC going. And although a lot of people don't like doing that, a lot of people, uh, most people hate SIBO more. So it's actually been a pretty compliant thing uh, that I have found in my experience. So the small intestine MMC is upregulated upregulated by Modalin, by Ghrelin, by 5-HTP, by acetylcholine, ginger, and D-limonene. So, you know, some of these hormones um, are not super easy to, to say take, but we can work with the MMC through these other ways. Down regulation is through uh, somatostatin hormone or through food poisoning, as we mentioned. So pharmaceutical treatment, there are a few things that have been shown to, um, to upregulate the MMC. So low dose erythromycin, um, 50 milligrams at bedtime, low dose um, naltrexone, 2.5 to 5 milligrams at bedtime, um, procalipride, 1 to 4 milligrams. Any of these things can really, really help. All of these are taken on an empty stomach, and all of these are taken for about three months. So pharmaceuticals tend to be used a little bit less um, long as, as some of these, these herbal medicines. And then from an herbal treatment, ginger, 5-HDP, D-limonene, Modal Pro, Iberogas, Free the MMC. Free the MMC is, is our product that we've created. Um, we like Chinese herbs, using some Chinese herbs. We source them from Taiwan because they're cleaner. Um, they have good organic, better organic centers in Taiwan. And the extract for some of the herbs is about five times stronger than Western herbs. So um, we've created a product that's ginger predominant. Um, that if you want information, we can always help you and, and, and ship you some of those too if you're interested in using any of that. And then ginger, so we see ginger here. Um, this is a, a study looking at ginger on phase three. So ginger basically will, will affect phase three of the migrating motor complex. And that's obviously super good because that's what we're looking to affect here. So this is looking at um, increasing, so looking at drugs that are 5-HTP um, agonists and showing that they are effective for increasing um, uh, migrating motor complex. And then Modal Pro is a product by Pure Encapsulations that I absolutely love. I've had great results with it. These are the ingredients in it. The challenge with Modal Pro is that it can sometimes, the ginger in it is something about how it breaks down in the stomach. Sometimes people can feel like this burning sensation in their stomach that isn't super comfortable. So, you know, you have to caution people about that. Always do any, no matter what treatment you're doing for the MMC, whether it's herbal, whether it's pharmaceutical, you always, always, always want to do that at bedtime. So once a day at bedtime is how we dose any of these. Um, Iberogas is another thing, another product that's come up more. Iberogas has been shown to reduce symptoms more than placebo as far as IBS. Some people are using it for the treatment of um, SIBO. It's just another thing to be to consider. And then um, we're using free the MMC. Like I said, I you know we haven't done research on this product, but we have a we have good results with it. And then D-limonene, there's not tons of research on it for the MMC but we have colleagues that are using it and having great success with it. So just wanted you to have another option there. So making sure additional treatment ideas, making sure that we're fasting at least four to five hours between meals, consider intermittent fasting if blood sugar is stable enough. Um, you know, obviously if we're having a blood sugar issue or even sometimes a um, thyroid issue, sometimes fasting can worsen a thyroid condition. So 
you know, we want to be careful about that, which is why we have addressed the thyroid here. And then, you know, monitor for SIBO recurrence. So making sure we're using the IBS store to, um, to test and make sure that we truly understand when we are done with treatment. I, I really think that no matter what we're doing clinically, retesting is so, so, so huge. I see people come in that told me that they had an H. pylori infection, for example, many years ago. And they'll come in, they never had any resolving of symptoms, and I'll test them, and they still have H. pylori. So, you know, no matter what we're doing, I think making sure that we're retesting is super, super important. And I say, I would think that I, I think that this particular test is one of the many times we're going to retest. We should always retest, but this one is an especially important retest because of how high these recurrence rates are. And, you know, people get so bloated and so uncomfortable with SIBO. So then just to talk to you about diet a little bit. So we see here, this is a study that basically showed that patients that were, that everybody was treated with rifaximin in the study, but patients, some patients were giving partially hydro, hydrolyzed guar gum at five grams per day for 10 days. And they basically had about a 25% better clinical um, resolution rate of SIBO. So why guar gum? Guar gum is something that is, say, non-SCD compliant. So that specific carbohydrate diet is really based upon where carbohydrates break down in the intestinal tract. So the idea with this SCD diet is that if carbohydrates break down higher in the gastrointestinal tract, like the stomach, then they're going to be broken up down so down that by the time they get to the small intestine, they're not going to feed SIBO because the um, because they've been broken down so much. So with a partially hydrolyzed gar guar gum, that actually will feed SIBO. So it's basically not specific carbohydrate diet compliant, meaning it's not going to break down in the stomach as a sugar, and it's going to make its way to the intestinal tract, and it will feed SIBO. But what we see here in this study is even though it was it, it did feed SIBO, that people actually perform better. So there's some, some theories on this in the field that perhaps by – feeding SIBO, um, it actually is a little bit more active and a little bit easier to kill that way. Um, that's just theoretical, but, you know, definitely some research data that's showing that, you know, it's not necessarily diet that's going to do anything. So in general, where we're at and where um, many of uh, the leaders in the field are with, with diet is that we treat, we, we give the diet based upon what patients can tolerate. So there's not research showing that low FODMAPs or SCD improves clinical results. However, some people do get a drastic improvement with symptoms. And so generally the way we tend to do things is we tend to give um, these dietary recommendations uh, to people in order to help improve their symptoms sooner than later, and then allow them to basically start you know, testing themselves and trying different foods so they can say, oh, this food that when they tried it, that they were actually, um, you know, noticing that it did affect them or did not affect them. So, you know, using the SCD FODMAP as a guideline, but then um, just basing it upon symptoms for there. And then, you know, another consideration based upon that study is giving people while we're giving treatment, giving them five grams per day of guar gum. So, and then always want to emphasize, in addition to the MMC, post-treatment, we really want to do a couple different things. We want to make sure that we are not just focusing on things like probiotics, once it's, you know, safe to give probiotics again, but we're really focusing on prebiotics. We see research that shows that probiotics, we can give probiotics for periods of time, test the microbiome prior, and then remove the probiotics, test the microbiome after, and we actually don't see change in the microbiome. But when we do see change in the microbiome, it's really with the prebiotics. So, you know, making sure that we're using, um, you know, inulin and fructooligosaccharides and some of the other great prebiotics resistant starches on the market, and then repairing the leaky gut, because remember, lipopolysaccharides um, can cause leaky gut. And I've seen, even though lipopolysaccharides are part of gram-negative bacteria, and that doesn't count for all of SIBO, um, there's research out there, too, that says gram-positive uh, bacteria can also cause leaky gut. So the chances of us having leaky gut is there no matter what. And, you know, luckily we have uh, the great intestinal permeability panel within the, the wheat zoomer that can also start to allow us to see is there intestinal permeability and then are we able to 
And then we should like follow up after doing an intestinal permeability treatment too, to make sure that's healed. So hopefully you can start to see how we can utilize this with the gut tumor and the wheat tumor um, to really build a very, very strong platform of understanding for what is going on in the patient and how it's affecting their intestines, how it's infecting both the small and the large, if there is intestinal permeability, if we have to worry about recurrence. So that's the that's what I have for you guys today. Um, I do have some time to stay on and answer a few questions. Um, so Sarah, can you help me with the questions, please? Yes. Okay. So I don't think you have the same screen that I do, but um, so this is the point where anybody listening in, if you do have a question, you can type it. There should be a little Q and A box for you that you can press. You can type your question. Um, so Dr. Mueller, we have two that are typed in and then we have some that are in the chat box. Um, first one is which lactobacillus aggravates SIBO? So I, honestly, I would be concerned about any potential lactobacillus other than lactobacillus plantarum. So lact, and I say that because, and I say that with caution, not that I've researched every single species of lactobacillus out there, but that lactobacillus plantarum is the one that I've seen that does not. So I would ex exercise caution around any, any of the other ones because I have seen people react to um, like a general lactobacillus product. But definitely plantarum seems to be safe. Great. Okay. Um, and then have you found a good PHGG project, product that you like? PHGG, uh, what does PHGG stand for? Oh, the fiber. You're talking about fiber. The, yeah. Oh, the, the, the guar gum. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, I'm just using things like Bob's Red Mill. So that's what I've been using in my clinical practice. It's just Bob's Red Mill. Cool. And then um, I'll throw out there on the lactobacillus plantarum, and I totally spaced on this one. Um, for those of you who prefer to use food-based stuff and fermented foods, um, but fermented foods tend to make SIBO worse initially, um, I have actually found a product called Good Belly that's a drink. It's just a fermented juice drink, and there's not much sugar in it at all, which doesn't really matter because I've used it on a lot of SIBO patients of my own and um, seen wonderful results. The only um, probiotic in it is lactobacillus. Um, plantarum, and that's the um, 299V as in Victor strain. And it comes in both gluten-free and non-gluten-free varieties. So you just want to um, make sure which one you're buying based on what your patient's needs are. Um, but if you want to find a drink product that's not a probiotic capsule, that is an option. And you can find that in most um, like health food stores. And it tastes really good too. So that's just an FYI. Um, let's see. What dose of D-limonene? D-limonene, that is something that I have not actually used. So I don't honestly, I'd have to look up doses and research. Um, I know it works, but I have not, like I said, it's something that more of my colleagues have used. So I'm not honestly sure on dosage of that one. Okay. Uh, let's see, we've got, how do you square need for prebiotics such as FOS and inulin as part of treatment when the patient may experience increase in GI symptoms with these FODMAPs? It's a good question. I, I don't honestly use prebiotics most of the time. I'll use a little bit of guar gum sometimes, um, but I don't tend to use prebiotics in the beginning when I'm saying let's do an SCD FODMAPs type of diet. Um, initially to kind of get a baseline. And then from there, once we get a baseline, then we can start adding things in and saying, okay, well, let's add some inulin, let's add some, you know, potato starch, some of the um, resistant starch types of foods and see how people do. So it's, it's, I find it to be a clearer thing to get a baseline than to actually uh, just start adding those in right away. Okay. And then, um, to add to that, so are you basically having them eliminate all of those to start with or, because I've seen both, 
where they can either just continue to eat how they eat, you know, make smart choices, help them, you know, eliminate junk and sugar and that kind of thing, but not necessarily going low FODMAP. Um, and then I've also seen where they do go low FODMAP and I don't really know that I've seen a difference as long as the SIBO is being treated, but do you, do you have a, have you seen anything different? No, I mean, just, you know, just like I was saying from a research perspective, a diet does not seem to change clinical results. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a conversation to have is to talk to patients about that and to let them know that, hey, by doing, you know, something that's a little bit more strict in the beginning, some people do get better symptomatic results quicker. Not gonna really change probably how long we have to treat you, but you might notice something sooner or faster. Mm -hmm. We don't know, but it's, it's gonna be the best shot in the dark of saying, hey, let's get a bunch of foods out and see if you can feel better or faster. And, you know, I always, if I do that for people, then I also let them know that this is not a permanent thing. This isn't like you're gonna be eating sure diet for the rest of your life. But I think it's good to just give people the data, just let them know it's not going to change clinical results. It could change symptoms. You know, are you, are you, is it important enough for you? Are you uncomfortable enough where you want to feel a difference, you know, quicker, sooner than later? And if so, it might be worth trying to diet at least for a week and seeing if that gives you some results. Okay, great. We will, uh, we'll do a couple more and then um, we'll start to wrap things up. We'll talk about the discount that we're offering um, for people who have attended tonight too. Um, last couple questions. What are some good spore-based probiotics? So Biospora is one, Megaspora is another, um, Zymogen also has another. They're, I think that's very brand new. Um, we, just, we just placed our order with Zymogen um, to order their new one. So I haven't tried that one yet, but Biospora and Megaspora are both great. Great, yeah. Uh, what dosage do you use for Allison? Around 200 milligrams a day. Um, Sometimes, depending on how bad the constipation is, I might push that to 200 milligrams twice a day. Um, I use uh, a variety, a couple of different products, Alamax I'll use or um, mm -hmm. Allison by Designs for Health. Um, but yeah, 200 milligrams, I would, I, if somebody is, is really, really severely constipated, it's worth, worth pushing to 200 twice a day. They're probably at that dosage going to burp up garlic mm -hmm. and they are probably at that dose going to sweat out garlic when they are, you know, exercising, but that can be worth it for some people. Yeah. All right. And then uh, last one, if a patient comes in with food poisoning, what are your preferred tests? Great question. Yeah. So I really, if somebody has food poisoning, I think looking at the entire picture is really important. So we definitely want to run the IVS shore, um, running a gut zoomer to make sure that we don't have some residual, you know, to see if the food poisoning was self-limited or to see if it's cleared. And then definitely running a wheat zoomer and, um, you know, running the wheat zoomer, you know, the, the wheat part of it may not be as connected to the um, food poisoning, but we definitely want to see if there's been any intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. And if we're doing intestinal permeability, it's, um, you know, we might as well look at wheat too, um, because it's all part of that same panel and can really help people, especially since we see, uh, very clearly that even in people that don't have um, IgE reactions or IgG reactions or have celiac, so all of these common ways that we react to gluten, um, gluten will still increase zonulin. And once in zonulin's increased, we have intestinal permeability. So, you know, I think it's, it's definitely worth throwing a wheat zoomer in there too. Okay. And then also to add to that, um, if the patient is actually experiencing acute symptoms of food poisoning, as in possibly the microorganism is still present, um, the gut zoomer may not be the best one, but the gut pathogens test that we just released um, a, a couple months ago, that might be a little bit better. Um, however, and I know this is a little confusing, you can do the gut zoomer and just add the pathogens, which would include... Um, you know, obviously the pathogenic bacteria that are already on the gut zoomer, but then we've also got candida parasites and viruses. Um, just in case what's causing their food poisoning is not bacterial in nature and, and might happen to be one of the various um, parasites or viruses that are out there. So that's just, um, and then yes, I see somebody asked about gut pathogens. It is PCR. That is based on the microchip. It's a DNA-based test. 
So that would be if you suspect that the infection is still ongoing, which for many of these pathogens, it is self-limiting. It's, it's typically, you know, 24 hours to three to four days. However, sometimes can go over that. So yeah, you have a, you have a kind of a small window of time where you would be able to actually test that. 